This video is sponsored by Pacific Coast Sleep. Looking for a new mattress? Pacific Coast Sleep is a personable, privately owned business that ships around the US, offering a variety of bed types and brands, including M. Lilly, Maxim, Seahawk Design, Futon Pillow Design, and more. Mention my name, Matthew Richards, to get 50% off your purchase. Ask about free delivery. Links in the description below. Back in July, as the Spanish cruise line Pullman Tour was in the middle of filing for bankruptcy, a surprising amount of people were heartbroken to see some historically iconic cruise ships prematurely ram into the beaches of Aliaga, Turkey for their first and last time. I say a surprising amount because historic cruise ships like the original Love Boat, the Pacific and Island Princess were scrapped without garnering nearly as much attention. Now, when a global pandemic has everything to do with it, it makes sense why so much attention would celebritize these particular ships. Hello everyone and welcome to my channel, where I attempt to transform our current situation into something just a little more seaworthy. When I found out that these ships were going to be scrapped, it hit me a lot harder than I thought it would. It's not enough that these ships probably had a good 10 years left on them, or that an entire cruise line, be it a subsidiary of Royal Caribbean, was going to go bankrupt in the midst of it. But it doesn't help that these ships played such a big part in the innovation of cruise design, and not to mention the personal attachment I have with the middle child of these particular brand of ships, the Monarch of the Seas. When 2020 happened, the cruise industry suffered forced to make difficult decisions about some of their older but still very lucrative cruise ships, like the Carnival Fantasy, which just went through an extensive refurb just a year ago. Within the past several months, five iconic ships were brought to their final destination one by one. Unsurprisingly, the number keeps growing. In another, perhaps more ideal world, one would think these majestic ships of the same generation could take up permanent residence in the same way the Queen Mary did and lined up together, they really do seem to complement one another. Like a group of old rivals who've finally found peace with one another. On the Carnival Corner, as mentioned before, we have the Carnival Fantasy. The first of her kind and quite the innovative marvel of her time. A subject matter so big that it's worthy of its own video altogether. Along with the Fantasy and in the same class are the Imagination and the Inspiration. Oh, and what's this? Oh no, they got the fascination now too? On the Royal Caribbean end are two of the three ships in the Sovereign class. Like the Fantasy, and perhaps even more so, the Sovereign of the Seas was the futuristic sensation of her time. The largest, non-repurposed, freshly built cruise ship in the world. 880.3 feet long and 73,192 gross tons. And just look at her dazzling pearly white hull, that fine streamlined profile with unique asymmetric green paint lines, the glistening green Lido windows, the debut of the fully developed Viking Crown Lounge cantilevered generously over the topmost deck about 14 stories above the ocean and offering full 360 degree views around the funnel, the shapely cruiser stern inspired by the celebrated French liner of 1935, the SS Normandie. Futuristic. You might just think the ship was ready to go into space. After a hit show from the 1970s filmed chiefly aboard the island and Pacific Princess, cruising was romanticized. Along with the help of the Big Red Boat Fleet and their partnership with Disney, cruising became more than just a thing for retirees and rich people, but also young and old and families alike. This is where we started seeing the rise of the major cruise lines of today. While Royal Caribbean already had four successful ships, they decided to really up their game. The Sovereign of the Seas, along with her two sisters, were built in the Chantiel de l'Atlantique shipyard in Saint-Nazaire, France the same place where the famous French liners like the Normandy was constructed a near century ago, and where the Queen Mary II would be built 14 years later as the newest, largest ocean liner in the world. Funny enough, the SS France, Sovereign of the Seas' rifle, was also built there several decades earlier. It was a challenging task that cost Royal Caribbean $183.5 million, which equates to about $419.8 million in today's money and it contributed to some really cool features. Special sound installation and flexible engine mounting was installed to reduce engine vibration, which proved to be very successful. The passengers come to me and say, 
how quiet it, the ship is. You know, what have you done to make the ship so quiet? I mean, they were all expecting a lot more vibration, a lot more noise. And of course, the reason why we have so little noise in the cabins, for instance, is that we have taken special precautions when we built the ship. The uh, sound insulation between the cabins are to the highest standards of we can build ship cabins today. And due to the design of the ship, diesel engines are mounted on flexible mountings which uh, stops the vibration being transferred to the hull and uh, thereby we have such a quiet ship. The Viking Crown Lounge hadn't been done on this scale before. Amenities like a large spa, casino and multi-deck atrium had also not been done, certainly not on modern cruise ships made for the common man. While NCL Norwegian Cruise Line performed an $80 million conversion to turn the France into the Norway, the ship was already advantaged to have two indoor pools and a lot of already created space to work with. So the Norway was both partly the inspiration, no, not that inspiration, that doesn't even make any sense, as well as the competition. One of the things that made launch day very special for the Sovereign of the Seas was the creation of the biggest champagne bottle ever created for a launch. 27 liters, in honor of the special occasion. Her maiden voyage in January 1988 was also unique in that she was unable to begin her maiden voyage on time. The glitzed up new ship was stuck in San Juan due to the inbound container vessel Long Beach being grounded in the channel. In the end, she only lost a day and made it into St. Thomas in due time. In 1991 came the slightly more advanced Monarch of the Seas. Advanced in that they added a deck completely dedicated to balcony cabins, which the Sovereign didn't have till years later. Like 18 years later when she undertook an extensive three-week refurbishment back in 2004. Royal Caribbean International's Sovereign of the Seas was designed in the mid-80s without balconies in any of the staterooms. But balconies have become necessary to compete in the cruise ship industry. So the Hot Works team is installing 61 of them to Deck 10. Most cruise ships are built with 60% uh, balconies, and this one has zero. We don't have a lot of balconies, but at least we have something. They also extended the specialty dining restaurant in the front of Deck 10 to cover the entire space directly above the bridge, rather than just partly. The pool deck had a slightly different layout, the interior decor had its own unique style, and all aft elevators led up to the Viking Crown Lounge, while only one did on the Sovereign. When Majesty of the Seas was completed in 1992, which was pretty much identical to the Monarch, the innovative trio was completed. Which reminds me of another fondness that I have attached with these ships. We're all millennials! I am happy to name this ship the Queen Mary. I wish this ship to her. I name this ship Queen Elizabeth II. Ships have always been christened by significant role models throughout history. For those of you who aren't aware, more recently ships are christened with a godmother or even godfather. It's mostly a PR move, but I'd like to think a very fun PR move. For example, Oprah Winfrey is the godmother of Holland America's 2018 New Amsterdam. In 2002, Julie Andrews became the godmother of Crystal Cruise Line's Crystal Serenity. Helen Mirren is the godmother of P&O's 2008 Ventura, and Catherine, Princess of Cambridge, is pretty appropriately godmother to the most recent royal princess in 2010. I christen you Sovereign of the Seas. God bless you, and may happiness and smooth seas follow you, your passengers, and your crew. Rosalind Carter, wife of former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, was godmother of Sovereign of the Seas. The Monarch of the Seas' godmother was one of my favorite Hollywood celebrities, Lauren Bacall, and Queen Sonia of Norway was godmother of the Majesty of the Seas, a very special tribute by my understanding. A Scandinavian architect who knew the meaning of sensational design, Nahal Aid, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, was the one responsible for so much of the innovative design of not just the Sovereign class, but many other Royal Caribbean Norwegian America Line, and even Princess Cruise Line ships. Royal Caribbean CEO Richard Fain describes Eid as having an amazing sense of dimensionality, of how a space would look, and more importantly, feel, when brought to life. He loved the color teal, and he loved curves. But it's expensive to build curves. 
John Maxstone Graham, a celebrated maritime historian, described Ide's design while discussing Sovereign's dining room as being a veritable Hollywood dining room. What movie designers produce in fantasy, Royal Caribbean Cruise Line has captured in glittering reality, cruising aesthetic benchmark, against which all rival dining rooms must be measured. By today's standards, the earthy, subdued colors and the shiny brass accent that was posh in the 80s is considered very dated, but I think in context for the time we could describe it as even a little daring. It's eccentric, retro sophistication at its finest. It's like we're in space in the 80s. And more on the point of the balcony feature. For a ship to have an entire deck dedicated to private balconies was eyebrow raising. It wasn't a brand new concept by any means. As early as 1911, the White Star Line's Olympic class ships offered private promenades, while the Normandy had a few verandas at the topmost section of the sun deck. In 1986, Cunard's luxury ship Queen Elizabeth II had two decks of balconies added to the forward section of her superstructure. But even up to the late 80s, the idea of having a balcony cabin was considered excess luxury for those with deep pockets. But the only people who can afford this are kings, millionaires, and auto mechanics. <laughs> As touched on before, the Sovereign class was also the first to have a multi-story atrium, which Royal Caribbean still refers to as the Centrum. And that is where we will begin our tour. Welcome aboard! The configuration was very new and unique with extra accommodations in the forward and upper portion of the ship. Accommodation forward, guest amenities aft. So you can imagine what an adventure it must have been to explore one of these ships for the first time. For some reason, it was near impossible to find pre pulmentor deck plans of the Sovereign of the Seas, so we're gonna work with what we have. Luckily, not much has changed. The first three passenger decks, decks two, three, and four, had ocean view and interior staterooms. At least in the past 10 years of operation, I have heard these staterooms described as small, like cramped. I heard the rooms were incredibly tiny. Oh my, this is tiny. <laughs> well, everyone, we're home. As well as uninspired. They're definitely not large, but they're adequate. Very clean, very nice. You know, uh, thankfully I'm one person. The only variety and comparable by today's standards that you got were the balcony and the handicapped cabins. Besides the view you got, even the cabins looking toward the bow were not unique or turned into semi-suites. But they worked for the time. A very short time, as it were. The initial idea was that guests would not be spending much time in their cabin, but out on deck enjoying their vacation. But back to the stunning five deck high centrum. A feature which has also since become commonplace is where you enter the ship. And just look at this stunning marvel. So many curves, so many layers and patterns, bedazzling lights. I'll never forget my first cruise aboard the Carnival Paradise and the moment I entered the ship's atrium. <laughs> See, I told you the atrium was awesome. Look at this. This is cool. Look. I was blown away by its impressive height, the massive skylight looking up to the world beyond, and the layers of decks visible to me. I can only imagine what it was like for guests when the idea was brand new. But more than just bragging aesthetic clout, the Centrum also provided a practical purpose. It allowed passengers to orient and get themselves around the ship more efficiently, while giving a very breathable experience to an otherwise very enclosed space. At ground level, slightly aft, the Centrum offered quick access to the art and photo gallery, the guest relations and shore excursions desk, and the two dining rooms, one right above the other, and each able to hold 650 people at any given time. While the layout was nothing original, the decor was. All three Sovereign class ships were themed in a sort of 80s homage to glitzy Hollywood and the artistic styles of Europe, as witnessed by the names of many of the lounges. Sovereign's Dining Room, for example, was named after the 1958 Academy Award winning musical Gigi, while Monarchs were named after famous artists Claude Monet and Vincent van Gogh. Majesties are simply named Starlight and Moonlight. The library had an English Tudor look, while European street lamp style pillars and Art Deco inspired brass finishes set the ambiance for some of the major public spaces. Funny how I noticed more of the pink than the teal. 
So very subtle. Deck 5 is where you had the Royale Shopping Center, the Casino Royale, which had nearly 170 slot machines, the Schooner Bar, and the Two Deck High Entertainment Lounge at the stern of all places. On the Sovereign it was called Follies, on Monarch Sound of Music, and on Majestic a Chorus Line. Movie titles I'm sure most of us are at least somewhat familiar with. Each held 675 people and housed a variety of shows, games, and classes. What made these particular theater lounges special were not only their size and height, but also their sightline access and lack of large support pillars, so that guests could view the show without any obstructions. Deck 6 is a space that has always made me scratch my head a little bit. It's this twilight zony half deck that acts as an extra space for staterooms, as well as a height buffer for the passenger facilities on Deck 5. It still boggles my head to think about how they came up with this. Something I haven't seen on any other cruise ship, though please correct me if I'm wrong. Deck 7 was where the lifeboats were hoisted and where the wraparound exterior promenade was, which was promoted to be both a jogging track as well as a sort of scenic It helped not only the flow of passenger traffic, but also provided intrigue to the views all around. It's not a feature that you see on a lot of modern cruise ships of today for some reason, and unlike some modern cruise ships of today, it was generously wide while not hindering the spacious feel of the entertainment spaces inside. Deck 7 included a conference center housing two conference rooms, some consulting and business services, another lounge, and the upper level of the theater lounge. Not to mention some stunning veranda views from the Normandy-inspired cruiser stern. Besides the obstructive lifeboat view staterooms, Deck 8 housed another lounge used for disco, jazz, and dancing, with an outer veranda deck I'm sure to allow guests to get some fresh air on those disco-y party nights at sea. Deck 9 is where the beauty salon and fitness center was located. Cruise ships of the day had these features, but not on this scale. You don't see this aft configuration in many cruise ships of today either, where spa and fitness options are usually located toward the very front with better access to the Lido pool area. Deck 10 is where the bridge was located. The Sovereign class were some of the last cruise ships to have exposed bridge wings, which apparently are more preferred by crew members. I'm guessing because of the easy access to fresh air. As discussed before, this was also where the only balcony cabins were available. Unless you were on Sovereign, of course. Aft of Deck 10 was Adventure Ocean for the kids. Great place for a kid zone in my opinion, as I'm sure the rhythmic veranda view from the stern was a very calming and enriching experience. Get them to love the sea at a young age, I say. This deck area had continued access to the Lido deck above, which featured a video arcade and a hangout spot called the Living Room, which sounds really 90s to me for some reason, as well as a teen disco. And finally we have deck 11, the Lido deck. On Sovereign, you had an outer deck above the bridge. On Monarch and Majesty, the Jade Restaurant took its place offering guests an alternative buffet with a slight extra charge, between $4 to $15 per person in the early 2000s. The Jade Restaurant was open from 6 to 9 p.m. and featured an eclectic variety of Asian cuisine, which sounds really good right about now, as well as a sushi chef available at your request. Behind this and separated by a scenic corridor with the iconic floor-to-ceiling rainforest green window tint that has since become iconic to Royal Caribbean was the Windjammer Cafe. The main buffet aboard spanning two decks which included the famous Sorrento's Pizza Bar. Which also sounds really good right about now. This multi-storied concept with skylight windows to boot was a very new and unique concept for a cruise ship, especially for a buffet and it was a very popular feature at the time. In the center were some of the biggest pools at sea. Not just one pool, but two pools. Oh, and a bar of course. Here also housed a hand-carved plaque, ornately bearing each of the ship's names, paying great homage to the efforts that went into the making of the ships, and the old English monarchy. Royal Caribbean. Medieval English government system meets Pirates of the Caribbean. No better combination treated like royalty in a tropical getaway environment. I get it, 
Actually, while figuring out the name for the Sovereign of the Seas, the name Sovereign of the Seas seemed too long. But Mortis Skaugen, who I think is pictured here somewhere, and whose name I hope I pronounced correctly, vehemently argued for it. Two ships already shared the same name. One a mighty Royal Navy warship from 1637, and the other a swift 1853 clipper ship built by Canadian ship designer Donald McKay. Royal Caribbean was shaping their sense of identity with more and more precision, and it seemed that it was the Sovereign of the Seas that solidified it. Aft was the upper portion of the Lido area where another jogging truck option was available. And finally we reach perhaps the most unique and exciting part of the ship, the Viking Crown Lounge. This was a feature available fleet-wide, but this one really takes the cake. Offering 360 degree views of the ship and of course, the view, while also housing a restaurant, bar, and multi-level viewing platforms. To me, not much compares to the Viking Crown Lounge on the Sovereign class ships, because even on more modern Royal Caribbean ships, the Viking Crown Lounge doesn't give you the full 360 degree view. What gives Royal Caribbean? And some just don't look as pretty or iconic. You can hardly tell it's there on the Oasis class ships, and the Quantum class doesn't even have them. And I'm sorry, but the Carnival Ride like North Star Observation deck doesn't make up for it. They added a rock climbing wall to enhance guest adrenaline aboard Monarch in particular in 2003. This hindered the 360 degree view slightly, but not like on some of the more modern ships in the fleet. I'm looking at you, Quantum Class. Once the trio became a full and complete set, they each partook in itineraries around different parts of the Caribbean, appropriately enough. Once new ships were added to the fleet, like the Legend of the Seas in 1994 and her five sisters following, itineraries could be diversified. In 1999, the Voyager class also entered the fleet and made an even bigger statement to what could be done on a cruise ship. Each ship had a very successful and illustrious life, while with Royal Caribbean and during their time with Paul Mentour. They were also met with controversy. The Sovereign of the Seas was well liked by both the ocean liner historian and the modern cruiser alike. Between 1998 and 1999, however, Royal Caribbean was fined $9 million, equivalent to about $14 million today, for dumping oily waste into the ocean and lying about it. And it was our dearly beloved Sovereign that was the culprit behind it. This didn't scathe her reputation too much though. In 2004, her extensive refurbishment was featured in a Travel Channel miniseries called Dry Dock, A Cruise Ship Reborn, which I was very excited to watch and made sure to tape every episode. <laughs> Sparkling ship on crystal waters is coming. Absolutely gorgeous. It was so much fun. The perfect lobster is coming. Our readers, they would do anything for us any time. Perfection is coming. A gift from the captain. Memories are coming. Seven days in Royal Caribbean's Caribbean are coming. You've got some Royal Caribbean coming. As the godmother of the Monarch of the Seas, Lauren Bacall did voiceovers for a few Royal Caribbean commercials. Thank you, that's what being a cruise ship godmother is all about. The Monarch of the Seas is also known to be the first mega cruise ship to have a female captain. In 2007, Swedish captain Karen Stahel Jensen, oh tell me I pronounced that name right, took charge of the ship. She also commanded the Serenity of the Seas and the Majesty of the Seas years later. In September 2017, while Stahel Jensen was still captain, the Majesty was part of the rescue efforts providing humanitarian supplies to St. Thomas in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma. On December 15, 1998, the Monarch of the Seas, while evacuating a passenger in St. Martin, grazed a reef on her way out, leaving a 131-foot gash in her hull. She even began to sink but after three months in dry dock, returned to sailing once more. From 2003 to 2008, the Monarch of the Seas took three to four night cruises out of Los Angeles to Baja, Mexico, which includes Catalina Island and Ensenada. During this time, in August of 2005, a gas leak, hydrogen sulfide to be exact, caused three members to be killed while 19 others were injured. 
A year later, on January 30th, 2006, 38 year old Captain Joern Rene Clausen was found dead in his stateroom while the ship was docked in Ensenada. No foul play was reported. Yeah, the Monarch of the Seas has been through a lot, and the people aboard her even more so. On another note, I can't remember exactly when Dad and I started making frequent trips to Los Angeles to watch the cruise ships leave, but it may have started on Monday, January 19th, 2004, when I desperately wanted to see Cunard's legendary liner Queen Elizabeth II, which only visited California once a year. It was a busy day. There were four cruise ships docked there, and this was shortly after 9-11, which meant security was tight. What looked to me like heavily armed military men asked us what we were doing there. When my dad said that we just wanted to see the QE2, they said that we can drive around the terminal once. And to make it quick. As you can imagine, it made for a very memorable experience. I actually found myself liking the ship, which was really hard at the time. I loved ocean liners of the past, and was convinced that all cruise ships were ugly and terrible and the worst thing you could put on the ocean, besides an oil rig, I suppose. We're going on that ship in January of 2006. At least that's what I kept announcing all the time. Dad, however, was not so sure, and being convinced it was going to happen didn't wind up actually making it happen. I've been privileged to have been able to take a cruise and to board a number of ships over the years for mostly journalistic purposes. But of the ships I've been on, I've never gotten to experience the unique qualities of a Royal Caribbean cruise ship. I haven't even seen one since 2008 when they pulled operations from Los Angeles altogether due to a combination of the swine flu, or H1N1, and political turmoil in Mexico, by what I understand. On my first cruise aboard the Paradise, I was so excited to see Monarch in tandem the first night, and I wasn't afraid to announce it. That is definitely the Monarch of the Sea, Dad. I'm thinking maybe we'll see the Monarch of the Seas. I kind of want to. And we are seeing it. Isn't that awesome? God does work his miracles. I found out years later that my godparents actually took a four-night Mexican Baja cruise aboard the Monarch of the Seas, which is where I got this mug, actually. Around the same time, this ship was just starting to be scrapped, strangely enough. It was the same year they pulled the namesake Sovereign of the Seas from the line altogether and sold her to Pulmentur. This smaller cruise line based in Spain, purchased by Royal Caribbean in 2006, did well to keep classic, though dated, cruise ships in service. Although it was sad to see Sovereign, and then in 2014, Monarch go, it was nice to know that they gave them another chance at life. And they proved to be very successful. The Sovereign was even featured in two feature films. A 2015 Bollywood film called Dil Dadak Nidu, translated to Let the Heart Beat, and a 2018 Spanish film called Yucatan, movies I may review in future videos. Bulmentur did really good jobs at modernizing these ships while keeping the integrity of their original form. Like Costa for Italians, Bulmentur was primarily marketed for Spanish-speaking travelers. No me impediría navegar a bordo si tuviera la oportunidad. The Majesty of the Seas almost got sold to Pullman Tour in 2014, but plans were reversed and she remains with Royal Caribbean to this day. I heard that they plan on keeping her for longer, but if current economic circumstances persist, they may be forced to give her the same premature fate as her two sisters. One reason why I'm using the past tense in describing these ships. Speaking of past tense, welcome to 2020 where years of planning can change on a dime. On December 16th, 2020, it was announced that both the Empress and the Majesty of the Seas were sold to an undisclosed buyer in the Asia-Pacific region. While it's no surprise to any of us, I'm sure, I'm at least grateful that the ships are still going to be with us in some capacity. The Majesty has had several major refurbs, the latest being in January 2018, so I could see why they would want to keep her for a few more years. Before 2020 happened, I used to watch the ship live in the Mallory Square cam in Key West, Florida, appreciating the fact that she was still alive and well with her namesake Cruise Line. She does not always have the greatest of reviews, however. Cruise Credit gives her a 3.5 average because of her age and lack of modern amenities. I get it. And when the time comes, the time comes. 
But while we still have her, I'm going to appreciate every moment. It's sad to see what was once the pride of a cruise line and the latest and greatest thing of a time period be later seen as old and outdated and ready for scrap, and in the end, underappreciated. Still, as early as 2001, the Sovereign of the Seas was beginning to become outdated to certain passengers, who for the price of a suite didn't even get a balcony. The ship's looks have been taken out of the 80s and into the 21st century and is now ready to take on paying customers. It's that age-old conundrum of relevancy meets sentimentality, of appreciation for the past clashing with the needs and desires of our current time period and the future. This is another fundamental reason why it's so sad to see significant parts of our past go. It's the sign of the end of an era, and it brings on this kind of insecurity about what's significant and what isn't. I'm not opposed to change, and a lot of people who are also lamenting the loss of these iconic ships aren't either. It's just a reality of life. When the Queen Mary debuted, she was taking over for the Mauritania, which so many were sad to see go. In the end, it's an opportunity for growth. Although these ships are being scrapped, their legacy lives on in future ships of their kind. Next up, we will be talking about the life and legacy of Carnival Cruise Line's fantasy class fun ships. How they innovated the cruise industry altogether, how they made affordable cruise vacations possible for millions of people throughout the years, including myself, and how they became something of a cultural icon. So, did you get to sail aboard one of the Sovereign class ships? Did you have a good time? Do you have any fond memories you'd like to share? Are you sad to see them go? Do you think that their time was up just a little too soon? Let me know in the comments, press the like button if you like this video, and subscribe to support my channel and for more content. In the meantime, my name is Matthew, and I will see you on the next voyage.